Good afternoon. Oops. All right, sorry, good afternoon. Um, welcome to Acadia 2020 and thank you for joining us and sorry for the feedback. Um, first, we would like to thank our sponsors, uh, without whose uh, generous support um, this event would not be possible. I need to um, repeat um, uh, uh, the Zoom spiel before we get started. This event is being recorded and will be available to registered conference attendees uh, uh, for viewing after the event and through November 30th. Conference attendees will be able to access the recording afterwards using the same link you used to join this webinar, accessible via our conference website. This session is also being streamed live to the public on Acadia's YouTube channel. This event is a Zoom webinar. Only the moderator and presenters are able to participate and broadcast their video and audio. Webinar attendees are able to watch the session and contribute via chat and Q&A interfaces. Conference attendees are welcome to use the chat interface during the event, but we ask that all attendees remain respectful in your comments and observe Acadia's code of conduct. If attendees have specific questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A function to ask your question. Questions in the Q&A will be reviewed and asked by the moderator. The moderator may choose to invite attendees with a specific question to activate their audio and ask the question live. And one of my co-chairs behind the scenes, um, either Maria, Adam, or Viola will, will help with that process. Um, so the um, format today, um, uh, I'll introduce the speakers. Um, followed by individual presentations. And then there will be a, um, a prepared response by our respondents. And then we'll have an open conversation. Um, so welcome again to the fifth in our series of keynote events, a conversation on labor and practice. I'm Brian Slocum, co-chair of this conference, secretary of Acadia, and principal of Diverse Projects, a small firm based in Mexico City. I'm very pleased to introduce our panel and the subject of this talk. I'll begin with our invited speakers. Peggy Deemer is Professor Emerita of Yale University School of Architecture and principal in the firm of Deemer Studio. She's the founding member of the Architecture Lobby, a group advocating for the, um, for the value of architectural design and labor. She's the editor of Architecture and Capitalism, 1845 to the present, and the architect as worker, immaterial labor, the creative class, and the politics of design, as well as the recently published Architecture and Labor. Her writings have appeared in journals such as Log, Avery Review, Eflux, and Harvard Design Magazine. Her theory work explores the relationship between subjectivity, design, and labor in the current economy. Her design work has appeared in Home, Home and Garden, Progressive Architecture, and the New York Times, among others. In 2018, she re received the Architectural Records Women in Architecture Activist Award. Next, a partner at Kieran Timberlake, Billy Faircloth leads a transdisciplinary group leveraging research, design, and problem-solving processes across fields including environmental management, chemical physics, material science, and architecture. She fosters collaboration between disciplines, trades, academies, and industries to define a relevant problem-solving boundary for the built environment. She has published and lectured internationally on themes including research methods for transdisciplinary and transscalar design practices, the production of new knowledge on materials, climate, and thermodynamic phenomena through the design of novel methods, tools, and work workflows, and the history of plastics and architecture to demonstrate how architecture's posture towards transdisciplinary practices and new knowledge has changed over time. She has taught at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design and Harvard University, and served as the Barbara McCurry Professor at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and Velux Visiting Professor at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts. She is the author of Plastics Now on Architecture's Relationship to a Continuously Emerging Material, which I just bought, thank you, published by Rutledge in 2015, and the recipient of Architectural Records Women in Architecture Innovator Award in 2017. 
Molly Claypool is an architecture theorist and activist. She is director of Automated Architecture Limited, R, a design and technology consultancy in the UK, and co-director of Design Computation Lab at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL, where she is history and theory coordinator of the MR Architectural Design Program in BPRO. Her work broadly focuses on is issues of social justice highlighted by increasing automation in architecture and design production, such as the future of work, housing, platforms, localized manufacturing, and circular economies. She is the managing editor of Perspectives, a new or open source peer reviewed journal supported by the Bartlett and co-editor of the recently published Robotic Building, Architecture in the Age of Automation. Molly has studied at Pratt Institute, AA School of Architecture and the Bartlett. In parallel to her work in architecture, she is also a trade unionist, environmental activist and birth worker. So why have this conversation now? It's no coincidence that in both the keynote conversations and the paper sessions, the themes of ethics, social responsibility, bias, productivity, automation, and optimiz optimization recur. Automated approaches to design, fabrication, and construction present disruptive and potentially transformative challenges to the conventional practice of architecture as computational workflows recalibrate traditional roles and responsibilities in both the physical and intellectual pr production of architecture. While the work of all of our panelists today is quite different, what struck me in attempting to synthesize for this introduction was that each in her own way is exploring ontologies of labor. In Peggy Deemer's activism with the architecture lobby and in her extensive writings on the topic of the subjectivities of labor and architectural practice, we hear an urgent call to question and tear down the self-defeating constructs in which architectural workers work. Through their work, Kieran Timberlake and Billy Faircloth have been calling for and redefining architectural practice for decades by actively inviting the productive disintegration of conventional boundaries in the profession, industry, and the academy. With her advocacy for an iterative and instrumentalized architectural theory to quote, achieve a more equitable built environment, unquote, and her work on the collective social implications of construction means and methods generally and computational design production in particular, Molly Claypool and our seek to completely reconceptualize the practice of construction, starting with design. We find ourselves at a totalizing inflection point that demands critical examination. And as so often happens in times of crisis, we call upon visionaries to help us to make sense of these things, to reveal latent realities through novel insights and sometimes radical yet imperative redefining of essential distinctions. I am very much looking forward to this conversation. Welcome to you all, and thank you. And first uh, to speak will be Peggy. Peggy, you can turn on your camera now. Right. Can everybody see the screen and hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so first of all, I want to thank the invitation to be part of this conversation. I was surprised when I got the invitation. I'm not a digital person at all, but I do think a lot about this work and in my experience as an academic have had to deal with it um, in, in the curriculum. So. Many thanks to Shelby Doyle, Adam Marcus, and, and definitely thanks to my co-presenters here, um, Molly and, and Billy, who I, I learned from. Um, so anyway, um, addressing labor in the context of digital technology and computational design is daunting for many reasons. One is the latent animosity between automation and labor, robots and algorithms increasingly just substitute capital for labor. Another is the implicit connection between design computation and innovation and a neoliberal attack on collective labor as marketplaces reward small number of stars. These tensions operate at two different scales, the macro level of the growing income inequality associated with the people 
organizations and countries that currently control IT production on the one hand, and the micro level of our own individual work and its precarious conditions on the other. I wanna focus on the micro level in the hope of making our labor as knowledge workers less abstract and thereby link it to an activism that can bring change to it, or if not to the micro level, to the institutional level, which serves that micro, macro level. I'm referring to academia and professionalism. Each institution would set up structural precarity. Hence, this talk is divided into two parts. My worry, and perhaps that of yours in, in you know, creating this session on labor, is that much of the computational material being explored concentrates on the efficacy of the products for constructors, owners, and users, while the context within which this research is being produced, the university and the office, remains not just inefficient, but untouched, unfair, hierarchical, unorganized, individualized, and competitive in nature. This talk looks at what I call the setups that these institutions throw at us to ensure labor precarity, but which also when acknowledged are changeable. In this, I waver between referring to the impl implicated worker as you or we, because again, I am not a digital worker, but I am both an academic and a practicing architect. So often I identify with the problem. So, to start with the academy and what I'm calling the setups of which there are six. Number one, university administrators evaluate, valuing of STEM education over and above the humanities represents a tax on the gains won in the 1960s in the academy and assures that what is valued in our work is precisely those subjects that are technical and marketable. The erosion of women's studies, minority studies, as well as other programs in the humanities that might link technology to biopolitics and governmentality is evident in the academy in general, but very pronounced in architecture, where we suddenly, with the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements, are panicking to catch up. An alliance with and support of the humanities is essential. Two, at the same time, sadly or ironically, architecture programs in the university want to make sure that they will never be seen as merely technical, as heaven forbid, for forbid vocational. Architecture programs need to guarantee that they land on the upper class side of a 19th century invented divide between trade schools and universities. In this, those working in digital technology must walk the fine line of making sure their research isn't merely technical, while, as per the STEM beckon, ensure that it's te technologically ensure that it's technologically scalable. I think about the various ways architecture schools deal with the technical by peripheral constructs, workshops that don't get credit labs and ateliers that are not part of the normal curriculum, specialized degrees outside the core norm. Often the thinking that is behind this proliferalization is logical and pedagogical. Sometimes it's merely snobbery and confusion. But in any case, as long as these computational subjects are put aside as an exception, the hard work of understanding their implications for the future of work and social sustainability is avoided. Three, universities also silo disciplines, which hurts professors and programs that benefit from working collaborative, collaboratively with other departments and disciplines. For all of the lip service that universities offer for interdisciplinarity, I think we all know of the difficulties that teachers have shared, with shared appointments have in, in getting recognition or tenure in one or both. The work that is respected, rewarded, and recognized for advancement remains department specific. One has to be a real star to get supported across departments, where, whereupon one is held up as an exceptional model, as basically abnormal. Those of you digital designers working in this siloed context need to fight for cross-disciplinary expertise and argue not just for larger intellectual value of your work, but that of other disciplinary transcending brothers and sisters that will help break the siloed system.
these following three setups are not specific to digital technologists or workers, but should be considered nevertheless because they affect one's subjectivity as an academic worker, particularly in the time of COVID. So in some way they deal with imposed and problematic neoliberal identities. So four, faculty are ready, are, are work ready employees. The assumption is that faculty come to class knowing everything about the university system and are on their own to figure out how a course is therein delivered. There is no support for or an initiation into the process of education itself, sink or swim. In this, I have often thought my, that my digitally oriented colleagues had an advantage in as much as they had tech support staff to offer the lowdown and how to deliver material within their context. But in the time of COVID, I suspect that the faculty adept in digital technology and IT are not only expected to know all there is to know about COVID induced distance learning techniques, but are often expected as well to teach other colleagues who are not. All faculty should stand up for the extra time and support they need for new courses in new formats, such as this extra labor doesn't profit the university at our expense. Five, all faculty are equal individuals. The assumption is that faculty as a category distinct from administration and students at the university and from practitioners without are a group of individual equals, equal in operating and knowledge as knowledge holders, salary workers and research pedagogy producers. But we know this is not true. The tenured non-tenured distinction is huge as is the on ladder off ladder distinction as are the more subtle differences of favoritism that give power often to white males, unrelated to rank to some and not others. Disguise is upheld until one is taken into a room to have your private talk with the Dean that indicates progress or not in that power structure. But even this news is not transparent in relationship to your colleagues or accepted guidelines. The fact that these differences aren't able to be discussed in an informed manner with fellow colleagues means that all pretend to not have worries or that these conditions are non-existent. At the same time, the university assumes and profits from our atomized individuality in a meritocracy, leading us to believe that if we just work hard enough, publish enough, get good enough teaching evaluations and so on, we will be protected from precarity. The double whammy of pretending that there are not power differences within a we are academics group while at the same time being forced to compete against each other means that there is only competition and no analysis of power that might lead to change. Six, faculty have nothing to learn from students. While we think there might be a tension between student needs and ours as faculty members, there is not. Both are exploited together, especially in online education, where both have little say about how, when, where, what, and why they will be teaching and educating at this time in the way that they do. More explicitly, faculty have things to learn from students who have proved to be more organized and proactive. Since the National Labor Relations Board decision in 1916, graduate students in both public and private universities across the country have used their unions to protect themselves against austerity and exploitation and win higher stipends and better working conditions. Faculty are harder to organize because of the previously described individuation and competition, but acceptance of that situation should not should be seen as self-imposed and hence discardable. So just as a summary to this kind of academic institutional um, uh, you know, set of circumstances, I want to suggest that we don't succumb to the narrative of sexualism, marginalization, peripheralization, individuation, and competition. We are all intellectual laborers. At the same time, we must recognize that our status as workers requires clarity about the power relations with one another, with our deans and with our universities. Without this clarity, no power analysis is possible and the status quo continues. So now moving on to the profession. A profession is a monopoly. Oh, let me just, ah, sorry, I'm 
I have missed something here to go to practice. In practice, digital technology operates in a series of setups that I think qualifies and quantifies the work you do. In general, these have to do with the tensions between traditional professionalism and the new type of work being done. So first of all, um, you know, when, one way to think about this is the difference in the kinds of offerings that, that digital technology produces, which is to say digital technologies offerings are generally products as opposed to services. This in many ways is a good thing. It makes firms less dependent on the vagaries of client calls, but it operates in a profession that has little capacity to understand, evaluate and disseminate such outputs. As a result, the intellectual labor that is associated with this type of output, apps, data capture platforms, has difficulty finding a home outside the academy. Karen Timberlake is an amazing exception in this, and I use them as, as examples in my lectures all the time, but exception it is. I know many graduates who've produced digitally innovative products, but have no workplace where they or their products can be deployed. Their intelligence goes into the air. Two, digital technologists play into a discourse of precision, exactitude, and efficiency, leading clients to expect and not pay for perfection. A shift in professional legitimization from a reliance on social origins and character value to a reliance on scientification of technique and efficiency of service has moved from one problem to another. In an article by David Salanto, the author of Innovator Parish, New Technologies and Architecture's Future in Harvard Design Magazine 26, he questions the head of capitalist set asset management for the state of Massachusetts on the lack of increased architectural fees for BIM projects that now were much more error-free. She replies, architects are paid to provide buildings without errors. Why should they be paid more to do this? In other words, more work, less profit, more liability. The shift away from an ideology of well-breadness to one of precision may actually have advantages for a profession that needs to enter the 21st century, but its advantages to the AEC industry still need to be argued and given credit where credit is due. As it is, the contractor and the client profit from our efforts at better processes and outcomes, and we doing the work do not. And here again, you know, I, I think that Kieran Timberlake, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from Billy in this, um, have managed to actually overcome that kind of scenario. But again, um, more of us need to know how. Um, three, the products of digital technology also move the discipline farther away from what Andrew Abbott in his systems of the professions identifies as the hallmark of professionalism, maintaining the right balance of abstraction. Knowledge must not be too abstract. This leads to a generalities with no content, nor can it be too concrete, which leads to perceptions of mere craft knowledge. Professions, unlike other industries, expand their cognitive domain by using their abstract knowledge to annex new areas as their own proper work sphere. Abstract knowledge is, in other words, the currency of professional competition. Again, this ultimately, I believe, is an okay thing, but working under an existing system of professionalism with an asymmetry that demands, will demand ambiguous product knowledge success. Hold on. Four, a profession is a monopoly. Its goal is to circumscribe this jurisdiction. Digital technology, to its credit, connects us to other areas of expertise, which threaten specialism's domain. Other experts, without the rule of behavior that our profession has, move more to threaten our monopoly. Again, this is not a bad thing. It breaks a mold that should be broken. Nevertheless, for now, those laboring in digital computation need to be somewhat two-faced about what their alliances with experts outside the architecture means for liability and reward in a profession that wants to remain fixed in traditional boundaries. Five, connected to this, but more specific, technology has been a threat to what architecture claims to be its one real sole property, aesthetics. 
While many firms like here in Timberlake have moved beyond this belief, we have also seen an increased kind of professional regression where architecture firms draw into themselves and disengage from tasks which connect them to clients, the public, and subordinate professionals. Even where offices, and I should include schools here as well, are open to kudos that are measured by things other than aesthetics, there continues to be an onus on computational workers to push the aesthetic appeal of their work. Um, and again, making the criteria of success for digital production somewhat ambiguous. And six, the emphasis on technological knowledge over ethical, aesthetic and abstract knowledge also leads us or coincides with a division of labor between the upper truly professional group and a lower subordinate one. This suppresses the contribution of various and important intellectual work. One thinks of the dilemma of people proficient in BIM who become identified as BIM monkeys. In architecture, there has traditionally been the division between draftspeople and architects slash designers. As Robert Gutman has pointed out, architectural office, offices from partners to architectural employees are unique for ordering production according to a principle of hierarchy, indeed hierarchies that are often illogical. This is in comparison to law and medicine, which operate under the principle of collegiality, in which all lawyers and physicians are regarded as equals, possessing equivalent rights to contribute to decision-making. In architectural firms, people with equivalent training and credentials frequently take their work orders from fellow professionals whose training is no different. What we see with today's BIM workers is like this, but different. They suffer both the degradation of its boredom and the scorn of the staff who see them as mere implementers. But the reality is they are far from draftspeople of old. The knowledge embedded in BIM and its workers is substantive and often more comprehensive than that owned by the partners. But again, traditional office hierarchies and division of labor ideologies prevent them from their true place in the order of things and the contribution is marginalized. So just to conclude, oh, so just to conclude around this, um, this kind of professional um, setups or catch 22s, the bad news is the digital labor and architecture is forced, to co forced into compromised positions by their other professional institutions, both written and ideological. But the good news is that it is also disrupting that institution and breaking a mold, as I have said, that needs to be broken. How? Though, do we guarantee that it breaks in the right direction? One, don't produce products just for the sake of novelty and entrepreneurialism. So many things that I see out there are new, but do they actually um, aid society in any particular way? Is producing what you are producing merely filling a false need that sirens of neoliberal innovation have thrust upon us? Or even worse, do they perpetuate a tailorist paradigm of efficiency where the apps and programs on offer survey and rule the actions and contributions of those building, building the projects and those living in them? One does not want to contribute to a world that may be smart and well controlled, but allows no room for the ad hoc, the deviant or the creative. And two, if as I'm suggesting, computational workers move away from traditional professionalism and operate more autonomously in the labor force, it is not to compete against one another or those who continue in traditional paths. Rather, it is to support each other, organize collectively and advocate for the social and monetary value of all of our work. Indeed, we are in a particular situation and those of you in digital, fabrica in digital fabrication particularly to advocate for all other marginalized workers, both in and out of our discipline. So just to go to the overall conclusion, to go back to the initial macro tensions that I brought up at the beginning between technology and labor, first a problem with a rush to automation and AI that will displace and not just, not just construction workers, but architects as well. And second, the blinders neoliberalism puts on our true needs as we rush towards innovation. I hope that I've indicated that there is a connection between the work you do at the everyday micro level in your particular institutional settings and the potential for change that can be brought out to these institutions 
which in turn will disrupt the workings of capitalism. I can't divorce this discussion from what I know of immaterial labor as handed down to us from its Italian operist and autonomia origins. In reaction to Marxism's claim for the primary cause or need for proletarianism, pro, 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 uh, the 70s workers claimed that factory work was not a good model for work. Nobody wanted to be in the factory floor. They also said that they didn't subscribe to an ideology that defined them exclusively as workers, that any definition of work that excluded effective or domestic labor was logically faulty, and that the power of the worker lay in the refusal to work. I wanna foreground these, these suggestions for two reasons. We need to see ourselves as more than our institutional descriptors and ask if we really, really believe in what we are doing and to be conscious of how much power we have if the answer is no. And just as the autonomists realized that the allegiances that mattered were not those of the factory floor, but rather the larger and more rhizomatic multitude that had collective intelligence, which could outmaneuver capitalism's striating tendencies, they knew the role of not just dissent, but of collective action, cooperation, and organization. I want to see this conference and this particular panel and, and its theme as preparing us for exactly that. So thank you. Okay, um, uh, are you able to see my screen? Indeed. Can you me? Excellent. All right, one second here. Let me reshuffle my desktop. Okay, so um, first, um, thank you, Peggy. Thanks, thank you for such an, an amazing talk. I wanna just sort of underscore this question you asked, do we really believe in what we are doing? Um, I also wanna just thank you for the introduction, Brian, and thank you to the chairs of the conference for inviting me to Acadia 2020. Uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of my colleagues and the work of my firm, Karen Timberlake. And today I want to discuss aspects of labor, computation and practice through the theme of building culture. So my comments are situated in my firm's commitment to collective intelligence and transdisciplinarity, as well as the day-by-day -day work that we do to build a culture of inquiry and the deep belief that we all have the agency to create knowledge. Um, they're also situated in the persistence to expand uh, what we might define as aesthetics to include other sets and types and structures of relationships, as well as um, the persistent question that we ask, which is why do we build the way that we do? So what is uh, the culture of building? So any discussion on computational design and its impact on the architect and architectural practice, and any discussion on automation as it relates to design, fabrication, and construction should be situated in a much larger context, which is building culture. So I'm proposing that we use the definition and argument offered by Professor Howard Davis, who in the book, The Culture of Building, which was published in 1999, assigns us a pretty hefty task. Um, first, uh, Davis acknowledges uh, that um, there's been a construction of more than 2 billion buildings globally. And then second, um, asks us to acknowledge where architects and architecture fit into this endeavor. So his purpose is not to limit that something is lacking in the building arts or to point out the minuscule percentage of buildings designed by architects. Rather, the purpose of this assignment is to correctly allocate architecture as a subset of building. A culture of building is, according to Davis, quote, 
a coordinated system of knowledge, rules, procedures, and habits that surrounds the building process in a given place and time. Architecture is not exempt from building culture, nor can architects make the case for their buildings being outside of the norm or exceptional. All buildings have significance and the building process is executed by the same network of people. Building is social and technical, social, ecological, and technical. Many professions, organizations, institutions, communities with different and competing agencies participate in building culture. Labor imprints on to building culture. So what does building culture have to do with computational design labor? Only when we examine who and what we are laboring for can we begin and to approach the question of computational design labor. So Davis also asks to consider an answer to the question, what kind of value does the current building process create? Does it create a good environment or improve the lives of people? Um, I think this question acknowledges that building culture creates value. And more importantly, it creates and sustains certain outcomes. So when we consider the breadth and depth of work in this community, it's not lost upon us that generally we're leveraging computational labor to fill a knowledge gap, to decrease complexity, to transform material practices, to restructure the role of feedback, to connect previously unconnected domains, and to connect previously unconnected scales. For many of us, computation and automation have been an incredible source of personal design agency. So to further explore personal design agency a bit, I want to try mapping uh, our personal design agency by looking at personal agency matrix. And now this is essentially a bi-directional graph that allows us to derive four quadrants based on our own personal attitudes towards practices and also towards collective in intelligence. So we can look at axis one, which I'm calling the domain of practices. And I wanna define practices here. So practices, the actual application or use of an idea, belief or method, as opposed to theories about such application or use. And we can acknowledge for each of us individually, it's very clear, we can say, well, these are my practices. I have practices. My practices are those ideas, beliefs, or methods through which I take direct action. These would be practices with knowledge that are said to be in the realm of my own personal expertise. But when I look at this, when I look at a personal agency, when I look at my own personal agency, I am certain to ascribe agency to you. So there are your practices, those ideas, beliefs, or methods that I rely on others, experts or consultants to act through. Um, but I also wanna acknowledge somewhere in the middle, though there are our practices. And these are ideas, beliefs, or methods which rely on collective intelligence or the integration of our knowledge. So the second axis in this bi-directional graph is going to be entrenchment. Entrenchment. So again, it, this means to establish an attitude, ritual, or habit so firmly that it's difficult to change. So if we look at the sort of axis of entrenchment, we can talk about whether or not these practices, attitudes, rituals, or, and, or habits are immutable. Are they capable of changing or being changed? Or are they immutable? They are unlikely to change over time or they're, they have yet to change. So for instance, um, from my perspective, my personal perspective, you might have the practice of robotic building and you're willing to make the changes to your workflow to engage my objectives, right? Um, or uh, from my perspective, um, you might have the capacity to optimize, if you're a materials manufacturer, you might have the capacity to optimize material ingredients to remove chemicals of concern and decrease global warming potential, but perhaps you're unable to execute on that capacity. So when we plot both scales bi-directionally, we derive four quadrants, and we can now see to which quadrants robotic building and materials optimization belong. I could have used 
any example here, any type of modeling practice, any type of uh, production practice, we could talk about many, many different types of practices. Um, but we also can see maybe four attitudes to our own work or to the work of others. Um, we can see that we might ascribe um, others to be nimble advisors. We might consider ourselves to be very nimble in our own practices, to be a nimble individual. Our practices are um, able to be um, mutable. We might uh, see that uh, someone is basically a resolute advisor. They're not going to change their practices at all. Um, they could be a resolute individual. Individually, they adhere to some very, very strict, strict practices. Um, but we also can appreciate that somewhere in the center, there's um, what I'll refer to as the R's domain. And on this, uh, at this R's domain, we can uh, acknowledge maybe that there are collective practices that are both nimble and resolute. So why is this relevant and where does it get interesting? I think it gets interesting when we recognize that often we use our personal design agency to move practices across this map. And we can see a lot of that happening in this space and in this community. So we must ask for a given practice, where do you think agency resides and how does agency work to instantiate change? Um, by mapping the perception of our agency, we can also recognize that there's not one source of agency when it comes to building, when it comes to building culture. There are competing agencies. There is alignment and realignment of agency. And by mapping my perception of, by mapping the perception of my own agency, I might also be mapping certain types of biases. Um, by mapping this perception, when I teach, I also find that I map the bias of my own pedagogy. Um, but we should also recognize that other practices uh, exist and that we have expectations of them. And we need to consider why we, or what motivates us to think that a practice should be ours or should be quote mine, when we recognize that it's someone else's. Um, but in another sense, we can look at um, other reflections on agency. So we could say that um, computational labor can reimagine and remap, and it does remap power relationships. A strength in our work is the concerted momentum to move practices into the ours, into that ours domain. A shortcoming in our work is that we lack the necessary methods to evaluate and understand actual outcomes. A pattern in our work is that we continue to identify practices that need to be driven from the French, maybe their practices of other, other disciplines, to the core of the profession in order to address something that's lacking in building culture. But there's another pattern in our work that needs more resolution. And it's the affirmation that design is a method amongst many methods. And we can drive our practices from the core of our profession to out to collaborate with other fields of inquiry. So then we can directly ask what kind of agency does computational labor create? What kind of value does computational labor create? What does it do to transform the environment or improve the lives of people? Those again were Davis's questions. So I want to um, end, um, uh, I have about 10 minutes left and I'm going to jump into a specific example of um, leveraging uh, design agency and expanding from mine to ours to some extent. So with this question, how is computational design labor transforming building culture? I wanna look at a couple of things happening inside our own practice. So I wanna begin first by just acknowledging that um, in our practice in Refabricating Architecture, which was written by uh, Stephen Karen and James Timberlake, it observed in, in 2003 um, that architecture remains immune to transformation and progress, um, that there was productivity and quality design, or qu sorry, quality decline. Uh, refabricating architecture challenges the normalized relationships between different people within this space, specifically material science, product engineering, architect and builder. These are the very relationships that govern how physical tangible parts become whole architecture and how architecture consequently performs. And if you're familiar with this book, you 
you'll likely recall that it used certain um, industries, the shipbuilding industry, the airplane industry, uh, the car manufacturing industry, um, to talk about how other industries actually fabricate complex things. And let's see. Okay. There we go. Um, the Loblolly House is located on uh, Maryland Chesapeake Bay. Uh, was in one sense putting the theory described in refabricating architecture into practice uh, through the design, fabrication, and construction of this house. We established a simple series of components, uh, blocks, uh, and cartridges that were to be inserted in a scaffold. There was an attitude towards tools uh, where we really looked at streamlining the primary tool that would be used to attach all these pieces of parts, which indicates an attitude towards labor. Um, we also had an attitude towards how we managed and designed the supply chain, um, really taking on this as the supply chain on as part of uh, what we were doing and how we were going to proceed creating partnerships uh, along the supply chain. And we also use BIM to reestablish craft uh, control dimensions, but also to directly fabricate the house with uh, a partner who was absolutely side by side in this on with us, um, Benson Wood. So um, the house was completed in 2007. It continues to be a test bed for experimentation. And while I could talk at length about that early experiment uh, with the house, it's another experiment with the house that I actually want to focus on. So there is an experiment um, that was planned for the future in this house, and that's actually uh, the disassembly of the house. So we did, we, we fabricated the house off site, we assembled the house on site, and at some future date, it can be fully disassembled. Its components are designed and engineered to retain their value. The house is designed for disassembly, and it anticipates at some point in the future uh, site restoration. Um, it's this experiment, or this um, premise, I should say, that um, that got us thinking about actually uh, playing this scenario out. So we wanted to directly uh, engage and proactively engage change over time. In 2008, uh, we wrote a specification for disassembly and to understand the value of recovered materials, we calculated the avoided burden of additional CO2 emissions. It was this calculation that was actually the spark in 2008 for a software that's now known as Tally. So this calculation um, allowed us to create a life cycle assessment application that lets us calculate the environmental impacts of our building material selections directly in uh, Autodesk Revit model. And so what does this mean? So just to give some background to this, why we're so interested in life cycle assessment and what it allows us to do, it allows us to tackle global warming potential. So why are we concerned about this? Buildings and infrastructure account for nearly 40% of all global CO2 emissions. Over a quarter of those emissions are from carbon embodied in building materials and construction. And so this seems like a small percentage as the emissions associated with building operations go to zero, this source of emissions, the source embodied in materials and construction matters more and more. So we have these two types of carbon we're wrestling with and now we've connected it directly to the design process. One type again is embodied carbon. It's the CO2 emissions associated with materials and construction processes throughout the whole life cycle of a building. The other one in contrast is operational carbon and it's associated with the energy used to run a building. Together, embodied carbon and operational carbon form a complete picture of carbon emissions associated with the building. And building owners, policymakers, materials manufacturers, contractors, community stakeholders, engineers, and architects are mobilizing to tackle embodied carbon. There is a transformation happening within the building industry. And that's because at year one, embodied carbon could account for up to 90% of a building's total annual emissions. And that's according to Architecture 2030. So as buildings become more efficient, embodied carbon will be responsible for almost half of the total new construction emissions between now and 2050. So what about Tally, this tool we've created? 
So we can use it to measure environmental impacts, specifically embodied carbon. But to connect this to our discussion, what was the goal of TALI? So our goal was to make life cycle assessment modeling, which was in the domain of another profession, accessible to designers who would use it to shape design decisions. Our strategy was to leverage building information modeling. We knew there were technical challenges, life cycle assessment practice was obscure, and it was also time intensive. And we also had in mind an intentional outcome that a building, we, knew, we know buildings cause impacts far beyond their building site. We have an ethical obligation to tackle climate change on every project. And the purposeful design of low or zero embodied carbon solutions demonstrates that building level design decisions are directly connected to global climate change mitigation strategies. In effect, our creation of TALI was a project of advocacy. So what did we learn in exercising our personal agency? So I can describe a couple of those lessons. First, we learned, and I know all of you have learned this, that bridging domains is messy, that credibility in a new computational space does matter, that when you bridge domains, you have to be prepared to provide modeling support, not only for that bridge, but also for each respective domain, that there are a few shortcuts to empathy. Every firm we found has a different approach for modeling and motivation for engaging this practice. But there's one lesson that moves from the mind to the Rs, and it's this, that the model data here is both an endpoint and a midpoint in other processes. So early in the development of this, we realized that build, the building data generated by the users of Tally had great potential and value to help us understand benchmarking across the wider energy industry to tackle a big issue. But we also realized that we weren't the right custodians for this kind of data. So there are two recent initiatives that um, allow us to feed results from tally into larger data sets. So first is the embodied carbon and construction calculator. It was debuted last November and it takes somewhat of a different perspective, but essentially what it does, it, it allows us to leverage tally's insight into quantity surveying uh, so that it can be used by contractors who are actually procuring materials so they can follow through on the carbon savings associated with certain materials. More recently, the AIA's data exchange is in the process of expanding its energy dashboard to include embodied carbon accounting and the next tally re release will allow users to export their own model results into the DDX to, to help create a much needed understanding of benchmarking and embodied carbon in buildings. So while I can demonstrate the use of tally in some outcomes, for instance, in this project, there's some very specific outcomes about how we engineered uh, this building this, and worked with the structural engineering team to make significant uh, embodied carbon reductions. There's also another lesson. Um, in, integrating life cycle assessment data into the design workflow requires us to continue to wrestle with our own personal design philosophies and to place a explicit value on outcomes. There's much work to be done to understand the ways in which embodied carbon figures are very specific design drivers and much work to be done by this community as it, access, as it makes access and use of this kind of data. But there also remain numerous challenges as this entire industry uh, coalesces around this question of real climate change mitigation there are some bigger questions that we're just starting to wrestle with. So how do we address issues of environmental justice? Increasingly, we are asked this, how do we go beyond global warming potential to other impacts? Um, and the other impacts such as eutrophication and acidification are actually local concerns. How do we do that? Um, other challenges we face are what are building product manufacturers doing to address embodied carbon? Many manufacturers are working to optimize their material ingredients to remove chemicals of concern and decrease, decrease global warming potential. And then there's another challenge. What are clients doing to address embodied carbon? Some are mo um, mobilizing. Another, what are policymakers doing to address embodied carbon? So you can see that it goes from a personal design agency to a much larger question of ours. So in closing, I wanna leave us with three questions. What are the outcomes of design computation labor and who benefits from it? 
What are the current barriers in our work and where are the gaps in our understanding? And who do we need to be in conversation with now? Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I'm hoping you can see my screen. Okay, so thanks very much, Billy and Peggy, for your insightful and important contributions on this topic and to the Board of Directors of Acadia for inviting me to participate in this event. I'm going to respond to Billy and Peggy's presentations with some work that we have been doing at Automated Architecture, or OUR, by talking about automation and labor. So I co-direct our with Gilles Retzen and Manuel Jimenez Garcia, and our work would not be possible without our team. Or my collaborator, Dr. Claire McAndrew from the Bartlett, and partners in most of the work I will show today, Melissa Mean, Hannah Clark, Chris Ingram from No West Media Center or KWMC The Factory. Now in the UK and our, we have developed partnerships and projects with organizations actively wo working at the local or community scale with our collaborations, building networks across the, the UK, currently across the Southeast Southwest corridor, but with the intention of expanding and scaling this network. We also have an amazing and supportive group of sponsors and funders. So the work of our is focused around issues of social justice. Automation is largely centralized and extractive creating more wealth for only the 0.1%. So a core belief that we hold in our is in the potential of increasing automation in architectural production to provide better opportunities and more housing for more people. Now, this is at the front of, this is at the backdrop of housing in the UK being absolutely the most unaffordable it has ever been. And this is not a unique situation, it's global. So we try to see automation not as centralized, but dispersed or diffused into communities as part of a wider network of activism. We design ways of working that can empower communities to participate in designing and making, to take back power and to create the homes and spaces that they need. Now we have the tools and the technologies to do this. We have precedents. We have WikiHouse, we have universal basic income, we have Fab Labs, we've got platforms and we have community land trusts. But what we don't have is the centering of the right kind of values within our disciplinary production model. We place profit before people and we succumb to the capitalist market. We also don't have the right kind of architectural syntax or production chain that can enable both increasing automation and community level engagement. We have a construction industry that's highly ineffective with productivity flatlined since the middle of the 20th century, a highly precarious workforce in short supply and construction is one of the least digitized industries worldwide. So at the core of our work in our is an approach familiar to this community that we call discrete, discrete automation, where we radically reduce the number of different kinds of parts that make up a building. This constructs an architectural syntax that acts as a, uni a universal framework that can support diversity in context, which we have demonstrated with our student work at, in RC4 at the Bartlett for many years. The discrete is also very well suited, suited for increasingly automated labor where we can begin to anticipate and design for full-scale robotic building. So in our work, we are typically using one single repeatable building block. And what we have found is that this makes the process of design production much more accessible for people typically othered by professional practice and industry, widening the boundaries of who can participate in this work. The projects that I'll show use block type A, a 120 by 60 by 20 centimeter timber block that is post-tensioned with steel rods, it is, a, it is a size and weight that one able-bodied person can carry. The different patterns that the block creates allows us to design for spatial diversity and contextual sensitivity without extending cost or production chains. This is unlike any other modular building system that's on the market. Block type A also uses both widely available automated fabrication technologies like a CNC machine and the 55 blocks fit in the back of a Luton van enough to build an office like ours that we had in the building center for six weeks earlier this year, or a garden shed or a small home extension. Block type A also uses simple tools and requires very little expertise and training to both prefab and assemble. Now key to our work is automation beyond the scale of fabrication too, and instead at the scale of coordination logistics or platforms. In our projects, we are working towards a cooperative model where the communities that we work with 
also become stakeholders in the platforms that we design. At the moment, we are developing a set of automated design, fabrication, and assembly tools that form the base of the platform. I'm gonna jump a little bit here between tools and projects. The tools include currently a web-based combinatorial design application developed in the last eight months in our projects, the collaborative construction platform funded by the Southwest Creative Technology Network and Block West funded by Transforming Construction, where we worked with tradespeople and local residents living in a 1930s council estate called Knoll West in Bristol in the UK. We've developed applications like this with students and many other projects previously, but we need this app to very quickly respond to the fact that we could no longer work in the physical space due to COVID. We had a group of participants who had a very diverse range of skills and experiences from master carpenters to young single parents, but most of them had never touched digital design software before. We needed a tool to act as a kind of leveling up platform between everyone involved. This required quite a lot of coordination and care with the creation of instructive home kits, on-call tech support hours, and other me mechanisms to facilitate home working. We used the app to, to co-design Block West, a community housing prototype now situated outside Knoll West Media Center in Bristol until the spring. Built out of 145 blocks and assembled together in less than two weeks, the project provided 25 part-time jobs in the local community throughout the six months of the project during COVID. This also act as a, acted as a training program for more permanent roles being created by our partners in the community, Nolas Media Center, and their We Can Make Home project, which has a 16 house pilot pro program beginning this autumn. This is important in an area like Knoll West, where there's no center or community hub, and where there has been very his little historical investment. It's often a place where money washes through rather than adding sustainable value or social infrastructure. In Block West, our, our group of 25 was almost 50% women, and we had people involved ages 12 to 76. John Bennett, one of our local residents, said about participating in Block West, the community has been at the heart. I never felt any top-down pressure. For me, it was about my personal development. I felt like I had a web of support around me with no barriers and no boundaries. I could dream it. I could say it. I could make it. It was really empowering. For once in my life, I wasn't being told, no, you can't do that. Instead, everything was doable. We also recently finished the prefab for House Block, where we are working with New City College and several of our other local community arts organizations in East London to build a full-scale two-story housing chunk. This will be built in Clapton, East London in spring of next year out of 270 block type A's. There is a core part to the structure and then an additional set of blocks that will be used to design a series of public program-esque takeovers by our community partners. We don't necessarily program exactly what they're going to do, but we do co-design the process of how they're going to do it. The project serves as a prototype for Hackney Council to begin to rethink how it can use smaller bits of land that it owns and can't necessarily develop. Now, at the moment, only our building systems are available on the application. As part of the project we are working on called Weekend Fab, a citizen-led housing factory also in Knoll West, we are developing a digital platform for multiple modular systems, such as ones by Mass Bespoke, U-Build, and Block Build to be produced alongside Block Type A. Now, to be designed using Block Type A squared, the factory is a project that further extends the existing fabrication and manufacturing capacity of Weekend Fab. Currently awaiting council approval, it is to be built on a large bit of land the council can't easily develop right on the edge of Knoll West. It'll both produce homes and community spaces and will be adapted over time into housing as the neighborhood of homes around it grows. The second tool is an instructive AR application for robotic assembly, where we are anticipating the automation of the production of blocks, as well as the production of block assembly, most likely in prefab chunks in a factory-like setting like the factory. The third tool is a VR application for the design and robotic assembly of, blo of blocks. In this example, we are automating the fabrication of a smaller scale and more high resolution building, building elements like a column or furniture. This gives people that experience of understanding what it's like to work alongside a robot and a coordinated kind of conversation between what they're actually designing in the app and how that would be built using an industrial scale robot. So to conclude, we believe that our approach uses digital labor and the discrete to begin to unravel the notion of expert and the professional, creating a more horizontal framework for wider participation in design automation. This also anticipates increasing robotic assembly in a post-capitalist economic paradigm where human labor might become increasingly obsolete. It also prompts ideas about what kinds of models for collaboration can provide the social and technological infrastructure for automation in housing to be citizen-centered. We're not interested in the one-off project, but in acting as part of a catalyst for sustainable and scalable work 
within the communities we are working in, collaborating with those communities to create lo local jobs and uplift local economies. And now I'll conclude and I'll just take a deep breath <laughs> and we'll move into the Q&A session with, with um, Peggy and Billy. Thanks very much. Hello, hello. Hi, Molly. Hi. Hi, Peggy. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Thank you. So, thanks so much. Um, so, I just um, wanted to thank you both for your really excellent presentations, and I'd like to just start with um, a first comment, um, uh, which is considering that we can't really talk, I think, about labor and practice without recognizing that computational design labor has been predominantly done by white men. And increasing automation means that those roles are going to be increasingly at risk. We see this in the people that we're working with in Null West who might be traditionally laborers who are essentially being written out of the story. But to what extent do you see this as an opportunity to begin to expand and reorganize the nature of this labor for radical inclusion and greater equity amongst BIPOC and women X? I say this in particular, as we've seen earlier this week in Ruha Benjamin's talk, that BIPOC are more largely affected by automation already, and women in BIPOC are most marginalized in, in the discipline. So how do you think we can do this? And to what degree do you think we have, to what challenges do you see in addressing this inequity? And maybe Billy, you could um, take a first stab at answering that question. I will take a first stab, but I, I do think that, um, yeah, I, I think that the work that you just showed, Molly, begins to demonstrate exactly some, you know, precisely some of the things we actually need to do. So I think from the outset, we can't, we're not gonna be able to address this unless we explicitly state uh, equity and inclusion as a real goal in our building practices. Without it being stated, we're not actually discussing it. And without these goals being stated, um, how, how, do we, how do we know what we're trying to aim towards? So I think there actually needs to be a real process for setting these goals. Um, you know, I've seen examples of folks within the building industry actually doing this, but um, they are, again, exceptions. Uh, so I think that's one thing that we need to do. I also think that um, we need to, you know, what you speak to and the question that you're asking is one about outcomes. Um, what will, uh, what will, um, the construction industry look like? What should it look like? I think one of the things that we're, we're missing and, um, and one of the things I, I tried to talk to or talk about in my, um, in my presentation was that we, we, don't, we currently don't do a, a good job um, at really knowing how to measure and understand these social outcomes. So even though we might start many of our projects and I'm talking about the R and our, our computational community, we start, might start many of our projects with um, deep aspirations for reconnecting or meeting a new goal or maybe even advocacy. There's still this um, larger issue of knowing how to evaluate whether or not you've actually um, met that goal. And so we need to learn how to measure other things. <laughs> we need to learn how to evaluate other things. I think that's part of this as well. But mm, I, yeah. I'll end it. No, I completely agree with you in that we need to learn how to, like, where are we measuring social value impact and how do we begin to, and other disciplines have ways of doing this. And I think this goes actually back to what Peggy talked about at the beginning of your presentation when you talked about this devaluing of the humanities within, um, within the architectural discipline, because the humanities has much, like, more ingrained practices of how to, to value social impact and value if I, I'm, I'm making an assumption from my very limited knowledge, but I think that that's true. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I very much agree with what, what Billy is, is saying, um, but I think we also have to just <laughs> address that kind of fundamental condition of how expensive our education is and how little reward people who might go into it are going to get. And so people, um, for whom uh, college, they're the first to go to college in their family um, or are looking at professionalization for the first time, will look at architecture, the expense of its education, the length of its education, and 
what, <laughs> what they're going to make and, and basically the precarity of, of the business that they're going to go into and just think, no, thank you. And, you know, and so it's a real barrier to getting people of, of color or from disadvantaged social circumstances to enter to the, into the profession. Um, you know, and this certainly includes um, gender issues, but it certainly includes racial issues and it includes economic issues. You know, and until we can figure out a better way of having the reward, um, it's gonna be a problem. This is where I do wanna link up with what, what Billy is talking about. Um, that one way that our, our architectural offices can actually, or the profession indicate that we deserve <laughs> more value is to be able to prove that our outcomes from this, from this knowledge gathering um, makes better buildings. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, and until we can kind of do that data, I think we're going to hear what I was suggesting you know, was, was said in that Harvard design interview is like, we expect profession, why should we pay more for it? Um, but if you can actually prove that this knowledge makes um, buildings in the long term um, perform better around many, many, many different conditions, it's, gonna, it's going to be hard. Um, but I also think that in some way it relates to um, what our relationship is to construction. Um, and if in some way, Molly, your great examples, and, and I think Billy, yours, yours too, is, is a beginning to redefine the relationship that architecture has to construction. Um, the construction industry needs to be brought on board. As long as we talk about this within the architecture profession and have projections into how construction is going to accept this and the unions do not want to accept it, we can't leave them out of that discussion. I think that's absolutely essential to, to the question that you're asking and how we begin to um, change on that side as well and, and bring them on board with our um, different aspirations. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I think also one of the things that we, I, we sorry, go for it. No, it's okay. I, I was wondering if I could ask Peggy a question. Yeah. Can I ask Peggy a question? Peggy, you mentioned something, and I think it's a really interesting direction to take this question. You mentioned something about our educational models and I'm just wondering, have you also been thinking about, you know, other, other educational models um, that might address this as well. Are you, are you suggesting that that we should be exploring other other methods of of education? Yes, um, <laughs> and and yes, you know, and, and clearly in in my critique of the profession, um, educational models that don't subscribe to NAB and and NCARB. Um, you know, I I, I think there's a mm -hmm. construct there that prevents all all the things that you're advocating from really being not the exception, but, but the norm. Um, mm -hmm. And um, absolutely, the, the architecture lobby is trying to put together a summer school that might model what that, what that new kind of education will be. <laughs> so, yes. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for indulging me, Molly. I appreciate it. We have some um, examples in London of, of models like that, like the London School of Architecture set up by yeah. Will Hunter, who's who's very yeah. much trying, I think, to do what you're talking about, Peggy, but yeah. also is is in kind of, you know, there's this kind of pushback against ARB and mm. RIBA there. But I think I'd like to just hone in a little bit more on education because I think that it's a really important uh, moment because the key, the, one of the core parts, at least in the UK, one of the core parts of education is design studio. I think in the US, I mean, I studied in the US, I grew up in the US, you have a much more pluralist approach to architectural education, but the design studio or the design unit are still very much setting up a kind of power structure or hierarchy that, um, that maybe isn't as open-ended or open-minded and maintains a kind of notion of the architect as being this kind of master. So I think one of the things that I'd like to ask, and, and Peggy, you talked about this a little bit in your presentation too, is thinking about in what ways do you think digital labor and automation can kind of help rethink or catalyze a rethinking of that power structure of the studio and what kinds of studio practices could be constructed and which ones also could be completely abandoned? Um, yeah, I think it's a really important question. I mean, as, as I was indicating, I think that, um, uh, 
computational design is a real disruptor and that's what we need, you know? And so um, the kinds of, of issues that come with computational design, um, uh, better performance, better carbon footprint, um, a, a sentence, a certain do-it-yourselfness that, that, that the communities can elaborate on. Um, those are the issues that get foregrounded with digital computation that are just out of the normal studio discourse. And so it's, it's less for the fabrication itself than the necessary questions that come with it. Another way of saying that is that digital computation and digital labor at least talks about labor. <laughs> it really puts it on the table in a way that normal design studio doesn't, you know, and, and we all, we all know what that is, you know, re reviews that do nothing but discuss whether you have a formally elegant project. Um, so bringing in the process of making um, and not just the final solution, which this foreground is absolutely essential. So I, I'm all for that. At the same time, I, I will just say that I've been to conferences for digital computation that are all about a kind of digital utopia. You know, and we can talk about your suggestion that we might get to a place where we don't actually have to do work. Um, I would love to talk about that, but nevertheless, in the kind of digital utopia conferences, um, there is zero discussion of things that we have learned that we need to worry about, like tailorization. I mean, just, mm -hmm. just to say. And so that's one place where in the academy, I think we really do need to make sure that the humanities are talked about in the studio at the same time that making is talking about in the studio, at the same time that procurement is talked about in the studio, all of those different things, um, mm -hmm. they need to be thought together. Yeah, I think that that sets us up. It's, a, it's an interesting problem because it sets up this, um, let's say the generation of people who are starting to study now, say that this is their first year in architecture school and they head into the first year studio and it's set up in a very Bauhaus or even Beaux-Arts, like let's say Beaux-Arts mainly, yeah. Beaux-Arts kind of set up and you're kind of confronted entirely in your very first year with this kind of structure of the relationship between labor and knowledge and expertise that sets you up for an expectation that that can't be unwritten. And I think that this is something that, you know, we need to, that needs to be looked at really urgently. And I know that is also very difficult to begin to unravel because first year is inherently the hardest year also to teach because you're doing not just an unraveling, you're not just, it's not just a skilling up a way of thinking and a way of drawing and a way of looking at the world. It's also an unraveling of all the other practices that came before in a traditional sense. So I think that there, if we were beginning to sort of like rethink what a good hierarchy of a first year would look like, we would be able to appreciate much better the con we would talk much more honestly about the context in which people come from, the labor that it takes for them to even get there, the situation that they might have at home that brings constraints into their ability to work, all of the things that kind of actually we're talking about a lot now with COVID. We're talking a lot about, you know, like what are the problems that our students are having to cope with. And I think that that, I hope at least that that becomes part or integrated into our practice as we enter, as students enter education. I completely agree. <laughs> Molly, the, you know, yeah, I do too. I think one thing that you just demonstrated really well is that um, pedagogy shapes the perception of our design agency um, mm -hmm. very, very early on. It's one of the central of pedagogy. And so um, one of the things we have to do it, as educators is step back and and ask ourselves what what perception of agency are we creating and uh, how are we structuring um, education um, differently. I think one of the other um, things that your work uh, does is um, it picks up on you know some of the threads that um, Peggy and I were talking about uh, around this notion of distributed knowledge. And so clearly the work that you're doing is trying to distribute distribute knowledge and to yeah. um, show that there's value in distributed knowledge models. Um, and also to, and I think, I don't want to say it's the converse of that, but also to say that um, I think there's, there's a, a, another perception or pedagogy that says that um, others create knowledge for architecture. Therefore, we do not have the agency to actually study and understand outcomes. We delimit um, legally 
delimit where our responsibility begins and ends. And therefore we um, uh, actually hamper our efforts to understand uh, the larger um, systems and effects that our, our work actually has. So mm -hmm. pedagogy needs to be fundamentally rethought, I believe, through the point of view of, of agency. Mm. Just to say, I, I completely agree with that, but you know, also to emphasize some, something, Molly, that you were saying um, that functions in that, which is recognizing that the students that come to first year um, don't just need another pedagogy, but we, read, we need to recognize the individuality and the intersectionality and the differences that they bring to the table, as opposed to thinking of that, that new pedagogy as wipe the slate clean <laughs> from who they are and what they've known and what they bring to something new. Um, and to think about those, those differences and, and the individual contributions that can, be, that can be made to that pedagogical discussion. Yeah, I think we are up against something though, like really, really massive in that, in that we have moved to a kind of marketization of higher education, where there is this, I think that that is one of the core problems with being able to like actually amplify that intersectionality because there's this idea of like, I'm paying, so you're giving me, and maybe that I don't necessarily, you know, like this, the exchange is different. Um, but this kind of touches on one other thing I wanted to talk about, which is, this notion of capital and money and wealth. So digital labor really goes hand in hand with extractive practices. You now productivity, infinite growth, which is a completely a construct anyway, as, as Billy has rightfully pointed out. And I think that all of these practices are really designed to be at the expense of the thing that we've talked about earlier, which is social value. So what do you think is really at the starting point for practices and the discipline to begin to rethink our relationship to capital and, and Billy maybe do you want to start there? Because I know that you touched on this uh, in a different way in, in your presentation. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, I, I think, you know, based on my presentation, one of the ways that we've, we've really tried to rethink our relationship to capital, but more, I think more specifically to these extractive pra practices, it, it began by just um, trying to expand uh, the system boundary and to say that somehow we have to think through, uh, um, let, I'll just say a life cycle thinking framework. We actually have to figure out and wrestle with that in a productive way. But then more importantly, I think what we're up against is this, um, you know, it, it's just a sort of uh, kind of fundamental shift in understanding um, that we, uh, you know, the, the decisions that we make um, are connected deeply into communities, to neighborhoods, and in a, in a really direct way. So these extractive practices, um, we can no longer pretend to be the customer at the end of a supply chain. We actually have to do the work to sort of bend that supply chain around on itself and to have the conversations and to build the conversation and discourse uh, and, and so, so for us, that's been you know, really where we've, we've started and a lot of the work that we've done is to, to, mm. to try to build up that discourse. But then also, uh, as I was attempting to show, um, I think the other place to begin is to just simply um, try to, to try to integrate it into your practice, to actually try to model um, what's happening, especially with extractive pra practices. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree with that, um, and want to want, and you know, part of what I want to emphasize there is not just being better business people and understanding, um, you know, precisely where your project fits into a larger discourse of real estate value and ownership gain and and all of that, which I, you know, if you're a good business architect, you'll do, but really to understand where this fits in that in that larger discourse where where architecture relates to construction relates to material goods relates to global exchange the whole procurement network that has to be understood and until we until we do that we're not going to as as students or practitioners um have a sense of our responsibility and without a sense of our responsibility a call to agency but but more than that 
um, I, I really believe as long as this is taken on um, at the level of each office, no headway is gonna be made. And this is where I really, really wanna advocate for architecture offices to work together and to work collaboratively um, in order to make a united voice for the profession of architecture um, that isn't divided and isn't competitive with each other, but really just makes a stake um, in, in the whole process, you know, a, around um, a healthy planet. And, mm. and, you know, just make a kind of clear statement that we refuse to do work that continues with extractive, uh, extractive practices. Um, so, yeah, not competition, collaboration, united voice, um, real strong ethical statements. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, think know, wanna, I, I think I appreciate that because you know what we've seen through our, our work on the example I showed with Tally is it's precisely that happening. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, we are one one small voice and a much larger, larger movement within the profession that's actually happening across in, in the construction industry with leading uh, contractors. Um, across different practices um, that are becoming um, deeply connected together and with manufacturers. And so it's, it's been, um, I would say, an unexpected outcome in, in many ways um, from where we started, but it was certainly what we had dreamt would happen. Um, ours is one small tool within a sea of other tools, but the Discourse is much, discourse across um, the supply chain with contractors, with other practices has been where the real value is. And um, it just gets back to the social and technical interface. Can I ask you, Billy, because one of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit was governance and our relationship to, to governing bodies. And Peggy, obviously, in your work with, um, with architecture lobby, and NCARB and ARB and um, the relationship to the professional bodies and Billy with what you're talking about in terms of um, in terms of relationship to other practices. I'm just wondering like where is the interface with governance? And I'm talking about like planning and policy making more than professionalization, I would say. Um, and I'm and I mean I know oh, we're beginning to interface in, in the work that we're doing, but we're obviously working at a completely different scale. <laughs> um, and I'm just curious where that plays a role yeah. in your thinking. I, I mean, for me personally, like governance is like, okay. So with, with Tally, um, I, from that point of view, uh, early on this, you know, the, the practice of integrated uh, life cycle modeling and carbon modeling into design process really quickly began to intersect with another um, um, movement that was happening to, to introduce uh, let's say, um, you know, carbon, embodied carbon benchmarks through different cities. So there are um, at the country level, but certainly at different city levels, um, different um, governing organizations saying that we're going to draw a line on this. And that is also causing things to happen. But governance in general, oh, you know, like, let's look at how codes are made. Let's look at actually who lobbies for changes in code, who has the power to lobby for change in code, right? I mean, that is an entirely other um, part of this that plays a huge role in everything that we're talking about. If we wanna transform building culture and building practices. You can't, I agree with you completely, you can't leave governance off the table, but you also have to look at how that lobbying um, actually happens right now. I've been yesterday I was in a, an event with in the for the Bristol Housing Festival which the Bristol Housing Festival is pretty powerful in Bristol which is where also where I live and where we're doing a lot of our work and um, the keynote speaker in the event it was um, uh, me and Melissa Mean, my collaborator and a woman who runs Maya which is a, a social justice organization in Birmingham um, the, the keynote speaker was Danny Kruger, who is a Tory MP from, <laughs> from Wiltshire, which is just, you know, to the east of um, where I live, who's, who's a very strange man because he's written some of the most open-minded um, housing, uh, well, prompts towards commoning in housing. 
Um, and it's kind of this like moral, it's become this kind of moral and ethical dilemma for me as someone who is definitely not a Tory to begin to open up these conversations. And I'm just wondering, you know, like where, at which point do you like draw a line um, around like ethical considerations when having to have these conversations and begin to amplify some of that, of that too? Yeah. I mean, just to say, it, the issue of governance makes me think about two different scales. One is kind of um, bottom up and top down. And, and the bottom up is in the work that um, we all want to be doing that the two of you are doing, which is very integrated with the communities. Um, it's, it's not a traditional client. Um, the more on the ground work one is doing, um, the more you then deal with what governance, what real estate, what coding, you know, what um, what policies affect that neighborhood, redlining, all those things. The more the more you kind of can't avoid governance at at that level, and so um, one gets one's I want to say hands dirty, but you know, when one's knowledge amplified by that. Um, and so the real work um, gets us there in some way and educates us. Mm -hmm. The top down really has to do, I think, with, I guess, what I was trying to emphasize in my talk, which is the institutional nature. You know, again, this isn't just our individual agency or the individual agency of a firm, but we operate in institutions that should be doing much more around <laughs> governance, um, just to say. Um, I, I think us architects at the School of Architecture at Yale should be putting pressure on Yale University ar around their endowments and, and, what, and what they're supporting and the governance that actually um, is basically real estate driven, um, you know, or, you know, we could say <laughs> that the AIA might actually begin to take stance on that and use their lobbying power limited as it is to talk about issues that I don't think they're willing to touch with a 10 foot pole in, in terms of governance. So um, we, need, we need our institutions to amplify our concerns. Yeah, I, there was, I, I heard this um, wonderful term yesterday, which was amplifying our inter interdependence, which I thought was a, a great way of thinking about what we've been talking about today. Um, I think we need to wrap up because there's going to be another session starting in 10 minutes, I think, or soon, really soon. Um, but I just want to thank so much, Peggy and Billy, for taking the time to be here with me today. I really, really appreciate it. It was wonderful to be able to talk to you both about this topic. And thanks so much to Acadia thanks, for having me. Thanks to you. Thanks to Billy. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Molly. Thanks to all the Acadia chairs and everyone out there. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to share a slide, but I can't get to my screen. Um, <laughs> Crazy Zoom. Okay. <laughs> there. So I just want to thank everybody because that was a fantastic talk. Um, and um, and thanks to Molly for, for um, moderating. And thanks to Billy and Peggy. It was really, really fantastic. And it, it's, it's not a big deal that we went over. I, th I think it was worth it. Um, and so I, uh, again, thank you. And um, thanks to all the co-chairs who are behind the scenes making it work. Um, next, we'll have a, uh, an abbreviated coffee break in the purple, purple murmur room. Um, and then um, later, um, there we'll start the paper session 11 at 4.15 p.m., which is uh, a little bit more than 10, a little less than 10 minutes from now. And then, um, and then later tonight, I want to encourage everybody to join us for the workshop showcase, which will start at 6 p.m. Eastern time. All right. Thanks so much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And really, it was such a great pleasure to you all. Thank you. <laughs>